So good evening and welcome to the Bell Museum's second annual statewide star party. This year, we are celebrating our dark skies virtually. And over the course of the next six days, you'll have the chance to hear from and connect with astronomers, park rangers, astrophotographers, and night sky enthusiasts who are all doing their part in protecting and celebrating our night skies. I'm Holly Menninger, the Director of Public Engagement and Science Learning at the Bell Museum, and I'll be your host this evening. This week, we are learning about and celebrating our night sky, a sky connected to the lands where we live, work, and explore. These lands were first inhabited by indigenous peoples. As a museum that aims to advance our collective understanding of both earth and sky, I would like to acknowledge that the Bell Muse Museum sits on the traditional and treaty land of the Dakota people. I would also like to acknowledge the Ojibwe people, traditional keepers of land to the north. Dakota and Ojibwe knowledge systems are crucial ways of knowing this place now called Minnesota, and we at the Bell honor and honor that knowledge and the values embedded in it. We have an exciting lineup for you this evening, starting with a keynote talk by Dr. Connie Walker on why and how we should be protecting our night skies. At 8 p.m., we'll learn more about how we can all get involved and contribute to our scientific understanding of dark skies here in Minnesota and around the world through participation in the Globe at Night Citizen Science Project. And then at 8.30 p.m., our Bell Museum Planetarium team will, sh will share telescope views from the Bell Museum's observation deck right here in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'd like to thank Ruth and John Huss for their generous support of the statewide star party and other Bell astronomy programs, as well as the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, part of the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment. A few technical notes to maximize your experience this evening. Please use the Q&A feature in, the Zoom, in Zoom along the bar at the bottom to send in your questions, comments for our presenters throughout the evening. Our team will be behind the scenes monitoring and curating those for conversation. You may have noticed that we are also live captioning our event. If you find those captions distracting or not useful, you can hide them by clicking on the live CC button also at the bottom of your Zoom window. In addition to this live stream, we'll post recorded videos to the Bell Museum website for later viewing. You can find astronomy links, activities, and extra resources on our statewide star party website, z.umn.edu slash swsp-2020. Okay, we're gonna get to it. It is now my great pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker. Dr. Connie Walker is a scientist at the National Science Foundation's National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory, known as the Noir Lab in Tucson, Arizona. She has worked for 14 years regionally, nationally, and internationally on light pollution issues, and today is the director of Globe at Night, an international citizen science project. Along the way, Connie has been on the board of directors for the International Dark Sky Association for six years and is currently the president of the International Astronomical Union's Commission on Observatory Site Protection, working on light pollution issues. She is also currently co-hosting several workshops, sessions, and conferences on the hot topic of, of the impact of satellite constellations on astronomy, a new type of light pollution. And here's the coolest fact about Connie. She has an asteroid named after her. That would be asteroid 29292 underscore, or 29292 Connie underscore Walker, uh, which I think is pretty darn cool. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dr. Walker. We're so excited to have you here and the Zoom floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. It's exciting to be here and thank you uh, to the audience for coming. There's a lot of people that are logged in and it's very wonderful to see that. And it means that you have a dedicated interest to protecting your starry night sky. And we'll, as we'll learn, it's not that difficult to, to do. And if we all participate, you know, you can think globally, but act locally. And that's what we're going to do here tonight. All right. So let's go to the next slide, please. So I thought I'd start out with um, a beautiful scene to sort of get you in the mindset of what I'm trying to convey here. So if you could imagine that you lived to the next to the most beautiful green meadow filled with flowers and trees and a trickling stream, and the whole area was just teeming with wildlife. 
And, and you can imagine, perhaps, that this place has been in your family for generations. You treasure this place. It has inspired your grandfather to become a writer, your mother to become an artist, you to become a musician, and your daughter to become a scientist. What would you do if one day you found that that landscape and the water in the trickling stream was polluted? Now imagine the landscape is the sky. And it is the most beautiful starry night sky you have ever seen. So many stars, you cannot tell one constellation from another. And the Milky Way arching overhead is so bright that it casts a shadow of you on the ground. Scenes like this actually exist, but they are slowly disappearing. Okay, now imagine you live in one of these cities that you see brightly lit from above the, the earth here. Um, what kind of sky would you actually see? if you actually could see a starry night sky. In this case, the pollution comes in the form of light by people for whom lighting up the night sky is usually a commonplace thing. Lighting is not bad, but bad quality lighting isn't good. And the challenge to fix the problem then becomes threefold. First, if, if somebody has never seen a beautifully starry night sky and has always lived in the city and never experienced the joy and the awe that comes from viewing a gorgeous a starry night sky, th there's a problem. If they've never experienced that, um, how do you convince them to even pay attention to what you're saying? Second, how do you convince them to care about what you're saying? And third, how do you convince them to care enough that they actually take some action? Let's think about this a little more. Next slide, please. So there's many different effects that light pollution has on our lives. And one is our cultural heritage. So the night sky has been a source of inspiration and wonder since the dawn of humanity. Our cultural collective, our, excuse me, our collective cultural um, heritage of the starry night sky has inspired many artists, for instance, like Van Gogh or Van Gogh with his starry night painting, and Holst in his musical a composition, The Planets, and Shakespeare in his sonnets about the moon. We lose a means for inspiration and imagination when we lose a starry night, dark night sky. So what are the things to be lose when we can no longer view a pristinely dark starry night sky? Um, too much light at night, or prolonged exposure to lights at night, I should say, um, affects energy, and human health and wildlife in a variety of ways. So first of all, when you think about the energy consumption, billions of dollars a year are wasted in energy consumption through unshielded lights shining up where, the, where we don't need the lights and, and uh, staying on longer than, than is needed, as you probably, a lot of you already know. Um, but other issues can, can, um, are pretty much with health. And there's three factors I usually mention. Uh, and one is on glare. And for me, <laughs> I'm getting to the age where the aging eye creates, um, you know, we have glare. It creates hazards, actually. And, and uh, then you have other things like light trespass into your bedroom window when, you, window when you're trying to sleep. It makes it very difficult. So there's issues like that. And then there's um, issues with basically something that's related to your circadian rhythm. So we're diurnal animals. We like to... Um, you know, sleep at night usually and, and work during the day and are have fun during the day. So we're, we need that night, day, night um, kind of um, rhythm to keep us um, alert and, and, uh, and a lot of other things. But there's something called circadian sensitivities that if, if your day, night cycle is disrupted, you actually uh, create a higher risk for things like obesity, believe it or not, things like depression or sleep disorders, and even some links now are to conditions of diabetes. So there's a lot of health issues. And then you have another health issue, which, which uh, is related to your melatonin levels. And inside, you know, you have a pineal gland inside your brain, and this produces a melatonin, and it's like a hormone, basically. And, um, and, the, and at night, you actually replete the amount of melatonin you have when you have a good night's sleep in a dark room. If you are uh, simulating sort of a daytime condition, uh, then you're actually repleting, uh, you're actually depleting the melatonin in the daytime. So you're, if you um, don't allow yourself to have that, that darkness at night, the melatonin will not get repleted. So that actually, um, you know, has sometimes they say, and I think there's more and more proof now to certain types of cancer, believe it or not. So it's, you know, it's kind of good to um, 
have at least a dark night, a dark uh, room to sleep in at night. So and this is not necessarily totally having to do with outside lights, but if you have light trespass into your room, it does. it is associated with outdoor lighting. And then, of course, you have the effect on animals. And, um, <laughs> and that... Uh, um, because of a lot of light and then I could go into this and make a whole presentation on this uh, but like you know there's no time <laughs> tonight um, so, but there's migrating birds uh, that are confused by city lights and there's sea turtles that are hatching and trying to get back into the ocean and um, and so a lot of the habits and habitats of these animals are neg negatively affected and uh, of course you have the night sky um, that you know everybody on earth has a right to view a starry night sky, and it's being slowly washed out by by light pollution and um, and preventing us from you know exploring and enjoying uh, our further understanding and appreciation of our universe and the origins of, of uh, our origins basically. So if we could go please to the very next slide, that would be great. Um, at this point, I'd like to mention just a few simple uh, actions you can take to protect uh, the night sky around your own home. And this is a wonderful postcard that uh, the International Dark Sky Association puts out. And uh, you can find it on their website and download it as a PDF if you'd like. Um, excuse me. And, um, and what it has on there are five basic steps. And it talks about, you can see in number one, uh, you know, well, actually, I'll just summarize it here. Um, for instance, you can ask yourself, does the outdoor lights you have around your house serve a clear and necessary purpose? Um, or you could ask, uh, is the amount of light appropriate for the intended task? Do you need that much light? Can you work with, you know, less? Or are the light bulbs are energy efficient? And does the light fall where it's needed uh, and it's shielded and facing downward? Um, do you have active controls, perhaps something like timers, motion sensors, dimmers, and um, and does your light is it sort of an energy efficient light where it's a warmer color they call it, so it's more red um, or orangey uh, color, um, so that does so that it doesn't emit as much of the harmful blue light that can actually at night cause the melatonin levels to be um, replete, uh, depleted. So I think it's best to kind of consider these situations. And if you'd like more information on this, I would advocate very strongly that you check out the International Dark Sky um, Association's website, and that's darksky.org. And another thing I should mention about the International Dark Sky Association is that they're having the annual meeting this, th this Friday and Saturday, the 13th and the 14th. So if you go to their website, you can find out, out about more. It's a free meeting. So you'll learn a lot. You'll hear about... Uh, indigenous people, for instance, the first talk is by Annette Lee, and she represents a, a lot of what the Lakota uh, storytelling uh, uh, provides, and a lot of good lessons learned from that. So she'll be the first speaker on the first day, and I think it's around probably four o'clock your time that it starts on the uh, 13th. Anyway, so let's see, what else? So just to summarize, um, if you have good lighting, which is fully shielded, like it shows here, directed downwards, um, by, by using better lighting, we don't waste energy and we direct the light to where it's needed, not where it isn't. And the better we do that, the better we're able to see the stars. And it's a truly win, 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 win situation, as you can see here by the picture. Next, oh, I, I'm sorry, I should have said next slide. Okay, <laughs> well, here you go. Um, as you can see, as you go, if you, as you um, progress from, from left to right, your, your lighting um, situation is better, and also you can see more stars. So that summarizes that. I'm sorry about that. Um, next picture, please. Next slide. Thank you very much. And enter Globe at Night. Here we have Globe at Night, and this is one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today. And Globe at Night is a citizen science campaign that is known all over the world uh, for the last 14 years or so. We, and this year alone, we have about 26,000 measurements people have made. And I'll talk, talk to you about that in a minute. But, uh, and we have like 93 different countries involved in all the states in the United States, I'm proud to say. Um, and uh, to bring back the stars, we have to kind of think about the night as part of our landscape, like I was 
talking about at the very beginning. It's a valued environment and that deserves our attention and our preservation efforts. And um, I'm going to get a little bit philosophical on you guys <laughs> for a moment. Um, you know, to acknowledge that something has value requires uh, three things, basically. It requires an awareness of it. You know, that is, that is a, a challenge. Um, it requires um, uh, sort of a connection to the relevance of our lives. And it requires, hopefully, possible action, right? So we have talked a little bit about the relevance in terms of how light pollution affects our lives already. And we've discussed um, some simple ways in one of our last slides here of how um, we could actually take uh, action at our home. Um, one thing that, that we need to that actually kicks everything off is to actually try to bring awareness to people of the impact of light pollution. And that's one way of doing that is actually through the Globe at Night Citizen Science Campaign. So I'll, I'll talk about that now. Um, so what it is basically is that you are invited in a very simple way to record the night sky brightness by matching what you see. And in this month, it's Two, you have a choice of constellations, Pegasus or Perseus. So you, met, you match what you see towards those constellations with maps that we provide, or charts, star charts, basically, on our website. And, um, and what these charts represent are like one through seven. One has just a couple of stars, like in New York City. Um, and the other, chart seven at the other end, has so many stars you can't tell one constellation from another. Okay, I think... Let me get my cursor back here. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So I have some bragging rights, and I have to do that right now before we get too much further, because I want to show you as a means of inspiration what other people have done that just kind of floored me, and I think floored a lot of the other people, because they were just amazing. Now, for much of the year, I'd say probably at least half the year, if not more, um, actually, Australia was in the number one position. Um, and they had a lot of measurements. And really, it happened uh, in June, the most measurements came. Because they had a competition, like anyone else in the world <clears throat> could try to have. And in one night, which was their longest day, the longest night during the year, for them in the Southern Hemisphere, that's June 21st. For us in the Northern Hemisphere, that's December 21st. And you might want to think about why, for those of you that might not know. Um, but those uh, people in Australia uh, had a competition to get into the Guinness Book of World Records, and they did it. In one night, the whole country got 6,700 measurements. Think about that. One night. So, of course, they were the lead, right? <laughs> but since then, the U.S. surpassed them a little bit. So I think there's this little competition between the U.S. and Australia right now uh, going on. But let's go to the next slide here. And this is of um, an island that belonged, well, not belonged, but is, a, is part of Spain, right? It's called uh, the, um, the island of La Palma in the Canary Islands. So the archipelago of um, islands called the Canary Islands. And this is the island of La Palma. It is, you know, I, I saw that Spain had, you know, 33, almost three, 400 measurements. And uh, I said, oh, my goodness, where I can't see them on the continental part of Spain. Where are they coming from? And it was this tiny little island that's less than 700 kilometers. And you can see it's coming from a small segment of that tiny little island. But they are in third place, and they have nearly 3,400 points. So, it's you know, the big island of Hawaii is almost 15 times bigger than this little island. So just imagine. So if they can do it, Anywhere, anyone, anywhere could do it. All right. So to get you, let's go to the next slide, please. And to get you um, sort of um, in the mindset for what this is all about, I have a, a little um, video here. So if you want to activate that. Hello, everyone. My name is Connie Walker. I am the director of the Globe at Night Citizen Science Campaign and also an astronomer at the NSF's National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory here in the United States. In the Globe at Night project, people around the world go out at night, look up at the stars, and let us know what they see. In many areas around the globe, artificial lights on the ground shine up into the sky so that fewer and fewer stars are visible year after year. 
This light pollution from the ground is causing the stars to disappear. By telling us which stars in one constellation, like Orion, you can see from your location, the Globe at Night project measures light pollution around the globe year after year. By choosing which of these charts best matches your sky, you tell us how many stars are visible where you live. You can print these charts from our Globe at Night website or use our Globe at Night web app on your mobile phone instead of printing the charts. Telling us what you see in the night sky will help a lot. This is what Orion looks like for me in Tucson, Arizona, USA. If people make observations year after year, we can then measure how the number of stars people can see is changing. In 2020, we'd like to invite you, your friends, and your family to join people all around the world to take part in our major campaigns that occur in February and in March. Let's hear from some people who have taken part in the past. Hi, my name is Eileen Grabowski, and I live in Norman, Oklahoma, where my students and I do Globe at Night to look for Orion. Um, in town, we're a three or four on the magnitude chart. When we go out to our observing site at Washington Elementary, we're definitely a five. And then when we go to the Okie Tech Star Party in Kenton, Oklahoma, we're somewhere between the six and the seven. Bravo, I'm Savika Karolina Damjanovska. I live in April in Severna Macedonia, and for me, Orion is the same. Hello, my name is Kyra Zavia. I live in the small town of Waikowiti near Dunedin in the South Island of New Zealand. And for me, Orion looks like this. Oops. <laughs> it looks like this. Konbanwa, Ochi Nobuaki desu. Tokyo dewa, Orion za kono yoni miemasu. Hi, Maru Ezaku Barondi. Mo a kitende Uganda. Ma ni ma Orion skine dile. Olá, meu nome é Marcelo, eu moro em Campos Goitacazes, no Brasil, e eu vejo Orion dessa forma. Hallo, mein Name ist Sabine und ich wohne im Sternpark Biosphärenreservat Rhön. Und bei uns sieht man den Orion am Rande ungefähr so. Und mitten im Sternpark sieht man den Orion so. Hallo, mein Name ist Charlotte, mein Name ist Rebecca. Wir leben in Tucson, Arizona, und für uns ist Orion so wie das. You can stop the what does the sky up. look like where you Thank you. Let me go on to the next slide. Hello, everyone. My oh. name is Con. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. I hope that was, uh, that was a good introduction to Globe at Night. And I want to talk a little bit more about the details now uh, so that you can get acclimated into what you might want to do if you do want to get involved uh, with Globe at Night. So very, very simple. So first, to, to introduce you to the two constellations that we have um, in the Globe at Night uh, campaign this month, we have, for instance, the Pegasus. And here are some charts of Pegasus. There are seven um, star charts that we use in Globe at Night for a particular constellation. And the constellation should be somewhere between halfway, you know, from the ground overhead to the other, uh, you know, 45 degrees above the other horizon behind you. So it should be in the top part of the sky, basically, so it's easily visible for you. And so this is the case with Pegasus right now for Minnesota. And uh, and we have, as you can see, Pegasus is pretty easy to, to, to see in the night sky if you have a sky that is at least a chart three. Because if you look at your chart three, and um, maybe the person who's uh, controlling the slides here might want to just uh, put, circle the, the little square that's in the middle of a chart three, so that uh, people can see that. So, yep. Yep. You've got it. We'll make that little square there. Whoops. Don't go to the next slide just yet. <laughs> anyway, you get the picture. Um, you have in chart one, like the, what you'd see in New York, New York City. And then, and then it gets better and better as you go to higher chart numbers. You see more and more stars. And this is our way of delineating how much light pollution you might have in your location. And again, if you look at the winged horse that was there, you can see the square quite vividly. And here it is again, the square in chart four. So, and it'll be in chart five and be in chart six. You just have more and more stars as you can. And, and it helps um, by what you're trying to look for is actually the faintest star that you can see in the night sky. You're not counting stars because if you were in a location like chart seven, my goodness, you would be there all night. 
right? So we're just looking for the faintest star that you can see in this uh, in one of these charts versus what you see in the night sky. So you're comparing night sky, what you see visually with these charts. And that's all there really is to it. And, uh, and I'll show you in a minute how easy it is to um, submit those observations. But let me first show you a little bit about um, the next constellation. And we can go to the next slide. So we have here um, per Perseus, and he is the monster slayer, basically, we call him. And so whereas for Pegasus, you were when you looked at Pegasus, you were looking toward the southwest and looking about more than 45 degrees above your horizon or more than halfway above your horizon, um, all the way up till almost the uh, top, you know, zenith, but not quite. And you'll see Perseus if you look toward, I mean, Pegasus, if you look towards the southwest. If you want to find Perseus, he's a tiny bit lower in the night sky right now from Minnesota, but um, you would go face east and then turn a little bit uh, east-northeast, they call it. So um, not quite halfway between east and, and um, north, but just a little bit over towards north, but not quite that much over. And you will go up again, above, above halfway above the night sky, and you will see Perseus. And he's a little bit more difficult to, to get. He looks like a very weird Y shape. And you can see it uh, here in the picture. And he's in between Capella and the Pleiades, basically. And you'll see that in the following pictures. In chart one, almost nothing is there. Oops, chart two, you see a little more. Chart three, and then chart four, finally, you can see a lot of... <laughs> That's okay. Thank you for trying to predict my movements here. <laughs> you can go to the next slide if you want to. There you go. Um, and you can see uh, in each of them, Capella and the Pleiades. And if you look between them and go a little bit up, you will uh, see the upside down Y, as you'll see it in the night sky right now in Minnesota. And um, Algol is right here in the constellation as well. And um, so that's how you locate uh, and try to find the, the, the constellation. And those are the stars you'll be trying to, to picture uh, and to compare with the charts we give you in Globe at Night. Okay, and it's basically comparison, a choice of comparisons. Um, and you will actually be measuring your light pollution level. So to do that now, no, um, that's okay. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> in um, in this particular slide, you, this is the um, just easy steps. And what makes it truly easy are a number of things here. First of all, I have to mention this um, taking the measurements only takes what thirty seconds. <laughs> but the part that is very important is that you go outside for at least 10 minutes, I would say 15, and if you have the time, even 20 minutes. Get your, get your eyes dark adapted. That means get them adjusted to the darkness that might be outside your house there so that you can take a, uh, an accurate measurement okay, of, of your light pollution levels. And once your, your eyes are adapted at least after 10 minutes, then you're gonna take these very easy measurements, all right? So, the first two steps are amazing because if you have a smart phone, it is going to automatically do steps number one and number two for you. Um, if it doesn't, all you have to do is put in the date in number one when you're making your observation, and then in, in number two, where uh, where you made your observation. And if you if you just put your um, if some people put their street addresses in there, some people put the, the nearest corner of the two streets that are nearest them uh, that, um, are, that meet. Um, some people, if they're at a momentous uh, monument somewhere, like the Eiffel Tower, they'll just put Eiffel Tower. And our software will, will immediately translate that into latitude and longitude. You're welcome to put latitude and longitude too, but you don't have to. It'll find it for you. And that's what gets logged is the latitude and the longitude. So that's number one and number two. And again, it'll be done automatically on smartphones. And another thing to note is you see how the and number one has two different images. We actually have the option at the top of the screen to go into night mode, and that prevents it from being white and glary. And so you have this sort of pinkish hue um, where you input stuff. Um, and then number three, that just mainly says um, is your measurement is how is measuring how dark or how bright your night sky is, and at the very bottom of that that screen um, for number three, you will see there's seven or eight different um, they call them thumbnail images, and when you click 
back on one of those, it appears as the bigger image in, in that, uh, in that uh, cell phone that you see there. And that's what's going, what's going to be your final measurement. Wherever you leave it, wherever you think that it compares to what you see is going to be your measurement. And that's how easy it is. So imagine if you had your cell phone on you and immediately put in, it's a smartphone, put, put in automatically the, the answers for number one and number two. The only thing you would have had to do is number three and then number four. And number four only has four choices as to what your sky conditions are like. And you choose which one is the closest, whether it's clear or all the way down to cloudy. And hopefully you're not taking measurements when it's totally cloudy because that is not really useful to us. Excuse me. So hopefully it's a, it's, a, it's a decent night when you're going out <laughs> and not too cloudy. And then, so if you had a smartphone, the only two things are those two measurements in three and four. And then number five um, is a choice. And I didn't bring it with me. I'm sorry. I'm actually visiting my daughter. So I, did, I forgot to bring my sky quality meter. But I'll show you what that's like next. And it's uh, no bigger than a pack of cards. But it can actually objectively take a measurement of the night sky brightness or darkness as well. And there's an opportunity, if you have one, you don't have to do this, it's optional, but um, there's an opportunity to enter that, that number as well in number five. And number six is just hitting that submit button and you are done in 30 seconds. Really, and it, it really has um, contributed a lot to have those measurements from around the world. I mean, you know, literally I can't go around the world and take these measurements. So thank you very much for those people who have participated and for the rest of you, we hope we can get you to participate. And here is our sky quality meter. And it's a point and shoot kind of thing. So you just hold it above your head. You make sure there's no obstructions in the way. You have a clear kind of view uh, above you. And uh, you just, um, you have to stay pretty still if you have a dark night sky because it takes a long time for the measurement actually to integrate. And you'll hear the tick, tick, tick actually sometimes. Uh, but if, it, if a bright sky is going to take the measurement pretty much right away. <laughs> and so you don't have to stand there for very long. Uh, and you just click that start button and the readout will be where it shows you right there. And that's the number you're going to record. That's it. So let's go to the next slide. So I won't uh, go to the website right now because I think that uh, either Holly or someone else on her staff might do that um, when it comes time for the star party. But I wanted to show you what it looks like, number one, and that it has a lot of really useful stuff that's underneath each of these um, uh, tabs at the header. So you'll see the words globe at night and then to the right of the words globe at night you'll see learn uh, where you can learn more about um, constellations and mythologies and all sorts of things and how to find your constellation in the night sky. You can see observe where that mostly tells you about um, the different steps to take your measurements and also when the const you know what constellations are assigned to what um, what uh, months and what uh, the dates are during those months for the campaign because the campaign is only ten nights during the month when the moon is not out in the early part of the night, so the first half of the night, that's when we encourage people during those 10 nights, and they're different 10 nights each month because the moon has a mind of its own. It goes, you know, 30, uh, 28 point something day cycles, and so it's going to change from month to month as to when Globe at Night will be. Okay. Well, and so, um, so we have also maps and data. So you can get maps from all the different years that we've had so far. And then in, under resources, you can download postcards that advertise about Global Nights. So say you belong to, you know, other uh, museums or libraries or schools and you want your kids to do projects. This is a good advertisement. And also we have activity guides for them if you cannot immediately use your computer to record. Um, and, you know, just things like that. So a lot of good information there. And if it's okay, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, okay. Now, how can the data be used? I just want to mention the usefulness of this data has come in all different um, categories and, and uh, good reasons. I mean, people have uh, done this to, and I'll show you an example in a minute, uh, for um, monitoring dark sky uh, or ordinance compliance. Excuse me. Some people have used it to do projects uh, to see how endangered, how light pollution might endanger an animal or human health or safety or energy consumption, different different things like that. And some people just uh, do it for, a, you know, just to monitor the, the data over time. So, I mean, how light pollution is changing in their city over time. A lot of good things. 
So um, in the next slide, we have just some examples I wanted to also brag. And these are examples, are, um, I'm going to see, what's this is slide 23? Yeah, 23. Okay, so this is... Um, Okay, this is a, a, for a bunch of, there's some students that were in um, a, a region called Michiana, uh, Michigan, Indiana area. It's closer to you than it is to me, but a few years back, there were about 3,700 students in one school district there. Uh, there were mm, a dozen elementary schools and a couple of middle schools uh, that got together under, you know, the adult supervision. And uh, they did Globe at Night and they decided that they were going to visualize their data differently than ever before. And this was amazing because what they did was make a Lego map, believe it or not. So six layers high, each layer a different color, each layer representing one of those charts I showed you. And uh, it was amazing. So they basically asked the question, how much of the night sky have they lost? And in, in, in their sky, for their thing, because they went through magnitudes 1 through 6 instead of 1 through 7, they, they said from a naturally night, naturally, um, natural night sky uh, to what they have was a factor of 9, I think, the results. So they, they did an extremely excellent job, and it was very amazing. Proud of these guys. Next slide. So I'm, I want to inspire you by doing this. So, And this, the first lady you saw holding up those charts for Globe at Night, Eileen, she's a science teacher in Norman, Oklahoma, and she had two high schools there and a, a, a bunch of amateur astronomers uh, take um, a, a grid map, basically, of their city and uh, noticed where, at the university primarily, where the lights were um, very, they, they were like globe lights. They're, kind of not that great light, lighting everywhere but where you need it. And uh, they brought this information, this chart, to their city council. And it took a couple of years, but they actually uh, got their lighting ordinances strengthened due to their efforts. And that was amazing. Next one. Next slide, please. Thanks. This is a different beast altogether. Uh, a few um, undergraduate students um, took up a, a challenge with the Arizona game and, and uh, fish uh, to, to actually take this, uh, the data that the Arizona game of fish got on the lesser long-nosed bats uh, and why they, did they traverse? They went around, actually, the city of Tucson instead of through it. And you can see that little peak in the middle, that's the center of the city where it's very light polluted. And these bats chose to circumvent the city. And these are threatened and endangered species of bat. And they said, oh, well, geez, how can we, do we have to strengthen the laws? Or can we just live with things as they are? Are they doing that circum circumventing for another reason? And they found out that it was one of three reasons why. And uh, so they didn't have to necessarily strengthen the laws. But it was an interesting study, and kudos to the undergrads who did this. Uh, next one, please. And this is one of my favorite things as of late. Um, these two young ladies that you saw at the very end of the video that I showed, the two twins, they were going for their silver award uh, with the Girl Scouts. And they, as a result, their project was to create this website. And I advocate Everybody go to this website. It's adorable, and it's Dark Skies for Kids. Um, and I got to be one of their mentors, and I was very proud of them. Um, so um, kudos to, the, to these two twins from Tucson, Arizona. Next, please. So the dates. You might want to know <laughs> when the dates are <laughs> for the campaign. And yes, you are at the start of the November campaign. We've had two days go by so far, but you have another more than a week to participate if you so choose. And then there's also a time in December and next year. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, it must be a little delayed reaction. Um, and so we have 12, uh, again, 12 campaigns this coming year. And you can see them all posted there, 10 days each month, changing a little bit each month, as you can see, and crossing over months by the end of the year. <laughs> and there's actually a 13th one, but we haven't shown it there, and it, it, it involves Christmas. So a number of these have to actually um, envelop holidays this year. So you can actually look at these dates for those of you who are at museums and libraries and schools and stuff, and you can take advantage of the fact that Globe at Night is actually embedded in, in a, I mean, a, 
holidays are embedded in the weeks for Globe at Night for more than half of these choices here. It's pretty, pretty neat. And I think we have just a couple more slides. Aha, uh -huh. here's the challenge. And it's for you guys. Now, yeah, you're off to a pretty good start. There's um, a bunch of measurements that are in mostly Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, 54 of the 69 globetite, globetite measurements uh, so far this year are from the state, uh, are from uh, um, located in Minneapolis, St. Paul. So, um, and this are, these are 69 measurements from Minnesota altogether. And, uh, and so my challenge to you guys, and I think Holly backed me up on this, I know Nadia does, is to uh, see if during the star party, the state can col collect about 500, perhaps, measurements. And it's possible if you all kind of, you know, take a few uh, at each location and, uh, and see if you can get to that goal and, and uh, increase the numbers of uh, number of measurements towards uh, the globe at night. So that's November's challenge, and you can continue to do this. And in fact, on the next slide here, in December, we're going to do this for everywhere in the world that's, well, actually, in, probably in the Northern Hemisphere, because December 21st is the longest night in the Northern Hemisphere. And we thought that that would give an equal opportunity to people in the Northern Hemisphere to take as many global night measurements as they possibly can. And of course, people from the Southern Hemisphere can, can also participate, but it's a little bit of a shorter night for them. And see how many that they can they can um, they can gather. Now, if you are familiar with uh, citizen science programs, which this is one, um, the first one that I think they attributed citizen science to. Well, I'm sure there's ones that were hundreds of years ago too. But in recent history, uh, that the um, Christmas bird count was one of the very first I think uh, citizen science programs ever. So we're kind of um, well. I don't know if you call it plagiarizing, <laughs> but we're kind of borrowing the title and calling this the, the Christmas star count. And I put count in parentheses because, again, you're not counting, but everybody's familiar with the Christmas bird count. So I thought I'd um, usurp that title <laughs> a little bit. And I hope you'll participate in that, too. So that's the dates from the 6th to the 15th in December. And it is before Christmas, but then again, that's when it is. That's when the moon's not out in the early part of the evening. And do we have any more slides there? Yes, I, I love I love this slide. This is one that was taken in Tucson when we had um, something called the um, Bio Blitz that was in Tucson a number of years ago. Um, so um, I, it's a little philosophical again, but I, as we overcome our, our ancient instincts, basically, telling us that we always have to push for more light and we're, we like that ever since the, the campfire, right, um, when we were you know, tens of thousands of years ago. Uh, we, we have to remember to simply look up, right, and enjoy our cultural heritage, the starry night sky, and hopefully be willing to protect it. And I can, I can stop there if you like. And it's just one more slide telling my contact information. There you go. So that's where you can find me. But actually, we're all at home. We're all working from home, so... My email is the best way to get, get to me. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. I hope everyone at home is giving a, uh, a round of applause. Um, we are, thank, thank you. you for that, for that wonderful, wonderful talk. So we are, um, I think we're gonna do some questions now, if that, if that is okay with you. Um, yeah, and I thought maybe we would start by talking about, um, you mentioned at the start of your talk about the beautiful starry skies and what that, ex that magical experience that people have. And I was wondering if you might be able to share what, what's been your most magical starry sky wow. moment? Well, there was one opportunity I had to go to Cape Town, South Africa, where that's acclaimed to be one of the darkest night skies around the world. And we went up to the observatory there called the South African Astronomical Observatory, or SAAO. And um, there were two other friends of mine there, two other colleagues uh, in the field of astronomy. And we just we just sat there. And it actually was the whole night that we sat there. And we just 
awed in bewilderment because before us was what they call the zodiacal light. If you have never accounted the zodiacal light, that was my first time ever seeing it so prominently. If you can imagine what looked like at that point a pillar of light, you know, coming from the horizon halfway up the night sky. It rivaled the brightness of the Milky Way galaxy. And if you can imagine from the southern hemisphere, you are looking at the center at that time of year of the Milky Way galaxy. And it rivaled the brightness of the center of the Milky Way galaxy. It was so bright. And what zodiacal light is, is dust in our solar system. Okay, these dust particles, all in the plane of our, of our solar system, right? So it's like a sheet of, of dust from, you know, the origin of our planets basically long ago, right? And maybe things that have collided since, like, you know, um, well, anyways, asteroids colliding or whatever. Um, but if, if you can imagine the sunlight glinting off of these, you know, reflecting off of these dust particles, that's what you're seeing from Earth. And it's amazing. So the sun's set, right? The sun's not up. It's a dark night. And you see this incredible pillar of light. And it... Um, it knocked my socks off, basically. And I had to stay up the whole night just to watch that, you know? It was amazing. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Uh, some of our audience members are, I think, putting their most magical Starry Night moments in, oh, in that's the a great question. Q&A box. And so that's a, that's a good reminder for me to remind our audience that if you have questions for Connie, um, please use the Q&A box. And then um, our team behind the scenes is is, is feeding those to me, one of the questions that has emerged, Connie, is people are looking in the app store for a Globe at Night app, but there isn't one, is there? No. Um, no. And could, could you tell people again how, how um, that well, it's a web app, correct? Well, yeah, it's, a, it's what they call a web app. And we sort of coined that many, many years ago. What happened was 14 years ago, there weren't many apps out there. We didn't even know really, well, it wasn't really very, very popular then. And um, we had to think about a way that people all over the world could use any platform that they, they, they had offhand. It could be, you know, any browser at all. It doesn't have to be one particular browser. It could be, um, it could be used by uh, your iPhone. It could be used by a Samsung. It could be used by any kind of phone. So we didn't want to have to build something just for one type of phone. Uh, we wanted to give people all over the world who had many different conditions the ability to be able to, to use this, uh, this web app. And so we did it as a, as a web page. But that web page can actually be used on any device. We made sure that it could be used on any device. So that's the difference between a web app and a regular web that you web, <laughs> regular app that you buy on the store. Right, and then people can just go; they can navigate to globeatnight.org to find the the and then yeah. to enter their. So it's globeatnight.org, and then the slash and the word web app and another slash. So that's it. Yeah. Excellent. Maybe we can put that in the chat, the chat window for everyone Absolutely. so that they can, they can. Absolutely. Link do you want me to do that? Or would you like to do that? Or? Uh, we, uh, I think, our, I think our team will be able to do that behind the scenes, which will be, will be easy peasy. So I have a, um, another question from Jerry. Um, and so it had, wants to know about like, how many clouds can you have in the sky and still uh, participate in, in Globe at Night? Does it have to be crystal clear or um, is, is there a little, is there a little bit of wiggle room there? Well, I mean, if, if you have a pretty clear view towards the constellation you're trying to measure and there's clouds all around that, I think that's perfectly fine. But you just, you just want to have a, a pretty clear view so you can actually um, tell what the, Mm, chart is you should be picking because otherwise the 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 measurement's going to be influenced by the the clouds that kind of cover the brightness of the stars and that won't give you a very very good measurement mm -hmm. do you use the same constellations each month no. every year or do you pick a different set of constellations oh. well it it does depend on the dates um so for instance this coming year um we can use I mean, it, it, well, the dates for March for Globe at Night are, are actually are at the beginning of the month, so you can still use Orion. But if the dates for, for March are much later in the month, you won't be able to use Orion. So the, the choice for March will change. The, the constellation will change. So we have to pick one that is something that's semi-distinctive because not all, not all constellations are as bright as Orion, for instance. But, you know, so you have to use one people can pick out and then it has to be the top half of the sky, basically, because then, you know, you're not looking through a lot of atmospheres. 
as you get closer and closer to the horizon, you're looking through two, three, whatever number of atmospheres they call it, instead of right overhead, where mm -hmm. there's only one atmosphere thickness. So I, it, it goes into more explanation, but that's about the easiest way I can. So that's that's how I was I was I was as a as a person who's not an astronomer by training, I was I was curious about the the selections of the of the constellations. Yeah. We have another question from an audience member named Di, um, and I think this is a very Minnesota question, um, or northern parts of the, the world question. Do northern lights contribute to light pollution? I, I saw that. That was one of the first questions, I think. And, I, you know, um, the northern lights, uh, they get a little bit to, to the area where, like, you know, southern Canada, uh, of course, uh, it's prevalent there, and, and Minnesota area. So, yeah, um, that's a natural light. Uh, I don't want to call it a pollution, but it's as an as natural light. You can't control that. So that yeah, yeah that is going to be a factor for some people at some nights. Um, I mean, I was up there many years ago, and I fought, saw my first northern lights. So it was but I was above Minnesota in the Quetico Provincial Park. You know where there's there's like a, the Boundary Waters. Yeah. Oh my God. And I saw my first. That, that was one of, another best experience. Oh my God. I saw my first northern lights, and the whole sky, the whole sky was covered with a white blanket that was flickering, right? right? And it was just amazing. So anyways, um, yeah, they, they can. They can influence. <laughs> but, you know, it's like the moon. Um, you try to avoid it. Uh, so you pick a time for the moon when it's not up. But for the nor northern lights, you can't always predict that. Unless you, well, sometimes you know when a shower, uh, 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 you know, there might be a lot of uh, northern lights out. But uh, you can't always predict that. So, yeah. Yeah. So, and we'll be we'll be talking to some of those folks from those northern parts tomorrow. This is just a plug for really? folks to continue on to, to day two of our of our state our statewide star party. Um, maybe we should we can talk to them too about about their opinion um, with that with that question. Um, so one of the, another question is is like is there so there's a ten day window when people can participate in Globet yeah. Night. Should you seize the first opportunity you have in that window, or do you recommend that people hold out to a? Is there an optimal date for? No, I think whenever you are available, and whenever you, you know the first opportunity you can get, because you never know when the you know the weather's going to get worse, right? So, you, and and you can do it more than once. I mean, it just depends on your willingness and your availability, whatever you'd like to do. But uh, any contribution would be very appreciated. Yeah. At least in the Twin Cities, it is very cloudy and rainy tonight. So I, I think our um, our oh. hopes of participating are going, are going to be dashed tonight. But we're really trying to encourage folks to to get out, um, and particularly on, I think, on Friday and Saturday night. Hopefully the weather will be better. Because you threw down a challenge. 500 yes. observations. Come on, Minnesota. Yes. We we got we got a we got some we got some work to do, uh, and you know there's almost 300 people on the call right now. So so I if everyone on the on on the Zoom went out and made observations, we would be over halfway there, which would be that's right that's right very, very exciting. Uh, one oh here Nancy asked a question because it's the season. How much of a problem are holiday lights? It's so I have to say, Connie, you're you're out in California right now and live in, in Tucson. Um, it was unseasonably warm here in Minnesota this last week, and many many people put up their holiday lights and have now turned and have now turned them on because it wasn't snowing and and, and cold. Um, and so I think holiday my holiday lights are very much on people's minds. Uh, what is that a problem um, in terms of of creating light pollution? Um, the answer is, is, well, there's a dual answer. Yes and no. It's, it's kind of hard to tell people they can't do that. Right. It's just, uh, and it's only seasonal. So, you know, some people leave it up for more than just a couple of weeks, which is not great, but, um, so you can't quite tell people that they shouldn't. But for me, when I go outside and there's a lot of, um, lights up that, in, in, you know, big lights, I mean, like what the city might do, not necessarily what a neighborhood might do, but it can be a problem viewing the night sky and, and then contributing to light pollution. But I'd say overall, probably not as much as, you know, um, uh, street lights and lights from shops that are shining outwards and not being, um, not having a quality kind of control. Um, those are the ones, and the cars too, and, and you know, just a lot of things that they can contribute to light pollution more so than just the street, just the Christmas lights, so, mm -hmm. yeah. 
I think earlier in the talk, you were talking about um, sort of hopeful actions and a lot of individual actions that we can take for combating late pollution. And you talked a little bit about some of the work that that that, stu that students have done. I'm curious if there's a role for um, municipalities and cities and, and governments to, to help think about um, and to help take more collective action um, yeah. about light pollution. Yeah, yeah, there's a number of cities um, around the United States and around the world that have really looked at their, their, their laws, their ordinances, and you know, I'm I'm more familiar with what's happening, say in Tucson, and they've they've done they've gone to pretty good lengths in Tucson to control you know their lighting issues, and um, it, it can be easily done. It just depends on you know people have a lot of different priorities for their cities, and some some take higher priorities than others. But if people can get on the agenda, um, you know, just the fact that they want to preserve their starry night sky for a lot of the reasons I gave during the talk then I'd say work with your city council. And they, they actually have periods where you can comment on things and, and help change the laws. Uh, so I would say that's one way of being active in that regard. That's fantastic. I should say, we uh, we don't want to be exclusive just to Minnesota. We had a participant chime in from Wisconsin and asked if she could still, if they could still participate. Um, and we, wel we welcome people everywhere to participate in Globe at Night. Uh, we did throw down a Minnesota challenge, but I'm wondering if in the like adjacent regions of, um, of North Dakota and Wisconsin, we can count. Those, those, those two as they come in. Well, I want to be mindful of time because we have um, other things to move on. But I think maybe the one last question I'll ask is one that came in earlier from Whitney, who asked if you could recommend any other space astronomy citizen science campaigns that parents and kids could do together. I think Globe at Night is an excellent example, but I didn't know if you might want to share other other projects that, uh, that you'd want to shine a spotlight on uh, around I these topics. I think there are a few, and um, one one place that lists some of them are National Geographic. They list some space ones, and there was ones that came out from Discover Magazine. They had a big issue. Uh, there were six of them that they they touted, and one was Globe at Night. Um, I think another in their in their list, Discover Magazine's list, was Spiral something or other. I can't remember the name right now. I'm so embarrassed. Um, but that was to do with um, the spiral galaxy uh, measuring the, the curvature and stuff like that for, for various reasons they can they can go into. And um, I know there's, for instance, there's one like a satellite streak watcher from NASA. Um, there's uh, another, I mean, I would just go to Discover Magazine, whatever their website name is, and look for their, um, their space citizen science programs. And it was just announced like last week, I think. And in conjunction with that, also one of the best places to look for any type of citizen science project, especially the ones for space, is a play, as a um, uh, list, I mean, sorry, a website and an organization that has done a lot for this uh, called Sci Starter. So it's capital S C I, capital S T A R T E R dot com. I think, or dot .org. Oh yep. my gosh. I'm, is it dot it's, com? It's, it's dot com. Yep. Thank you. And, and they are the ones, they are like the pinnacle besides the Citizen Science Alliance, I think, or association, sorry. Um, those two places are, are places where you can go and find, it's like a portal with, uh, with a, you know, so many citizen science programs, your jaw will drop basically. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, that's a great recommendation that you can, and you can sort and find projects based on topic or based on location near you. Um, that's a, that's a fantastic example. And I'll just plug for our audience too, on our statewide star party website, we have a tab with resources and activities um, that we will continue to update and add, add projects to there. And then we can certainly share those out on, on social media as well after, after tonight's live stream. So um, there are many more questions. I'm afraid that we weren't able to answer. Um, there are some that I think we're asking questions about observing at telescope observing in Minnesota. Um, we're not going to put you on the spot, Connie, for that. We'll let our planetarium team, who's going to be doing some live observing, um, answer those questions a little bit later than in the evening. So thank you, Connie, so much, so much. We well, really it was, appreciate you it was spending time and help us my help pleasure. kick it off. Yeah, it's truly really my pleasure. And I, I congratulate all of you for doing this momentous uh, event and a lot of kudos to Bell Museum uh, for doing this event. And I hope you all enjoy it and enjoy hopefully a clear 
<laughs> Starry Night Sky. Thank you.